hear from uh, make sure I don't murder his name too bad, Anwar Islam. Anwar is uh, the associate professor and extension forage specialist at the University of Wyoming. A little bit about Anwar. <coughs> He is the uh, he received his PhD in forage agronomy from the University of Sydney, Australia. His MS from the Institute of Postgraduate Studies of Agriculture in Bangladesh, and BS from Bangladesh Agricultural University. Anwar received extensive extensive postdoctoral trainings as a forage agronomist <coughs> at the Noble Foundation in Oklahoma. Uh, also in Japan and the Sydney University in Australia. His research and outreach, outreach activities aim to develop modern and innovative research and collection cultivar development. Uh, for hot, I ask him what he'd like to do for fun. And he says everything is fun. But he uh, likes to travel. So uh, he has, uh, he and his wife have uh, two daughters, one 14 and one nine. Join me in welcoming Amber. We want to make this really informal. Uh, during the presentation, if you have a question, you know, raise your hand. Uh, we'll also have a question period uh, after uh, after he's finished too. But, uh, I encourage uh, a lot of uh, interaction and in questions.
So, alfalfa breeding started long time ago. If I give you some, just a quick background, how alfalfa started. So, Mesor 9 jump was actually introduced in this. And that was long time ago, more than 200 years ago. 9, 1756, first it was introduced to USA, in eastern part of the USA. Then it did not survive, it did not succeed. The reason, the soil was so acidic on this region, so it could not survive. Then about 100 years later, in, in 1850, second introduction, and that was happened in California. And the introduction came from Spanish introduction. And it, was, it came from mainly in, from Chile and Peru. As a result, it was moving towards east to Kansas and stopped. It could not go to the north, it could not go to the south. Why? Because the introduction was from Peru and Chile. It was a subtropical area. It does not have tolerance to cold. And it did not go to the north, and it did not go to the south. Then, 1940, and 19 to 1940, this is the region when actually cold tolerant germ plasm came to USA, introduced to USA, and then the breeding program started, and nowadays we have hundreds, as I told you, more than 400 varieties, every year more than 30 varieties this each year, right? So probably you know that. Can anybody tell me? I have to move. Can anybody tell me how many varieties, not by broad range, how many species of alfalfa you can see in the market in your experience? First question, how many of you grow alfalfa? Many, very good. How many of you, how many types of alfalfa, major types? I saw a finger in the back. Yes. <coughs> you say right? You say that. Yes. If you look at that, there are three major group of alpha. Number one, probably you see the purple color of alpha. This is Medicago sativa, Sabi species sativa. This is purple color. This is the variety, this is the species it, you can cut many times. Okay? How many cards you can get in Wyoming, in Colorado? Three, four. Okay. How many cards we can expect in California? How many? Four. Four. That's right. Even there are some variety, you can go 15 cards in a year. This is from Satayama. But in Wyoming, in Colorado, there is no way. We cannot go. If we have two to three cards, we will be happy, right? But we need someone that high variety, how we can manage. That's the reason agronomy of alfalfa is really so important. Another, this is the flower, you can see it here, how the flower looks like, purple color. And the other one is yellow flower alfalfa. Okay, there's another type. This is septal cannon, okay? Yellow flower alfalfa. And <coughs> it is not multi, multi cut okay? It has low, uh, it is very similar to quality. But the problem is it does not produce as purple color, okay? And you cannot go too many cars on that. But it has, it is really good for, it has very good down tolerance, and you can go, you can grow without water or less water. And it has very good compatibility with the grasses. And you can see the flower, how it looks like. And the other type is actually mixed. It's naturally mixed together, and then it's called media, or variegated. And you can see in the same plant, three kinds. Sometimes if you look at your flowers, you'll see some yellow flower, very few. Sometimes you can see in the same plants, you can see three flowers together coming. So this is the picture, is the, from the same plant. You can see like that. So if you have like that, this is a clear indication that there is some kind of mixed variety you are planting. You are not getting good on that. So be careful on that. I will not be so now, I'll be talking today, I was requested to talk about agronomy. It's a big topic. I cannot talk in one hour every aspect. It's a so big, big topic. But I'll try to cover at least two important aspects. One is establishment, and the other one is the management. How establish is the number one challenge. 
followed by how we can manage so we can make our alfalfa industry even bigger, we can make more money. So really, in the morning I was talking to one of the producer grower here. He has a big, big experience, bad experience in failing establishment of another legume called same point. So we don't want to happen to because if we don't know, and we might have ended up <coughs> losing money on that. So actually, if you know, if you have everything correctly, if you know everything in advance, what will be happening, you will know that within two to three weeks after planting. How I am coming to this point in a minute. So, that is the problem, like always, the forest establishment is costly. The reason is the establishment, and the another reason is a lot of failures happen in the establishment. And if we fail even once, that costs a lot of money. The reason you lose the first year, and also another important thing is, even if you go second year planting, you are losing another year. Even partial success of this will cost a lot of money. You can lose hundred dollar per acre per year, even partial lose of your stand. So that's another significant effect why agronomy should be so important. So really I always suggest when I got a call, planning. Planning is very important. If you really you are the new alfalfa grower, you are planning to plant alfalfa, it is very important that you plant at least a year ago. Not just call me, like in, in my state, Wyoming, sometimes producer call me just seven days or 15 days ago and call me, Anwar, could you please tell me two things. I am planning to go plant alfalfa this year and then I want a variety of them when I can plant. I said, when you are going to plant? This fall, uh, this spring. How many days do you have in your hand? 15 days. I said, please, don't do this year. Go for the next year. This is not the plan. You have to have a good plan to do that. So I'll come this point even more details on that. So what are the important factors after you plan? What are the factors, uh, specifically in the establishment? So there are many factors we can consider before we even start planting alfalfa. The number one is soil pH, whether the soil is acidic or alkaline. How many of you know alfalfa, what is the requirement for alfalfa pH? Can, you tell, can anybody tell me? 6.8. Everybody agrees on that? Someone uh, shaking head. Why? What is the pH range we can grow alfalfa? It's really 6.8, you are right. Because we need around neutral pH. Alfalfa is so sensitive to soil pH. This is the first consideration. If you don't consider, you are going to lose, you are going to fail. So alfalfa requires really neutral pH. So if you go 6.8, even you can grow, in, in Wyoming, many places I grow on Papa 8.5, it's no problem, you can grow that. But the requirement, you cannot go below 6.8. If you go 6.5, no way, you cannot get out of Papa. Just stop there, you have to increase your soil pH, then you can plant for planting of Papa. Another factor, like soil fertility, seed preparation, time of planting, depth. Another important aspect is seed to soil contact. And then rate of seeding, the quality of seeds, of course, and then the weed control, pest control. So I'll go slowly, slowly. If I start talking all of this, I'll take two hours to talk everything. So what I'll do, I'll go one by one. The first thing, why we have so many failures in establishing alfalfa or any kind of forest plants, any pasture. Why? The number one reason is the seed size. Very small. If you look at the alfalfa, tiny seeds. Forget about coating of the seeds. So then, that means we can, it is easy to plant too deep, right? This is number one reason. I always tell my, my grower, my clientele, that be careful, alfalfa is very tiny seeds. And this is one of the reasons why we fail many times. Then another is soil surface dies quickly. Today, I was very happy li uh, listening the talk irrigation in alfalfa given by Professor 
uh, Bruce, right? Bruce Anderson. So he was also talking about the depthness of the soil. Because alfalfa requires a lot of water. And if you don't have proper depth, the soil will be dies quickly <coughs> and you are going to fail. Another aspect is in the sandy soil specifically. If I look at Wyoming or even some parts of Colorado, and also western part of Nebraska, if you look at it on that, we have a lot of weed, right? So because of the tiny seed, that's another important factor you should consider on that. Bigger, seed bigger. Because of the tiny seeds, alfalfa really has very small seedling at the beginning. So that's the reason we have to take care of very tiny, weak seedlings, how we can establish that at the beginning. <coughs> and then, another problem is heavy soil. If you have heavy soil, that means there's a problem with the casting of the soil, and you might lose your stem as well. So site selection is really important, I will come to this point at, in a minute. So what are the steps we should follow to be successful, especially if I am a new alfalfa producer and planning to do that? These are the steps really we need to follow. So number one, site selection. Okay. What are the sites? I have 500 acres or 400 acres land. Which area should I go and plant alfalfa? So that's the planning. So that's the reason I say it always. Planning does half of the job. Okay, and you need to plan at least a year ago, really if you want to plant alfalfa, to be successful on that. Because you are going to invest a lot of money and you want, you want to make money on that, right? So this is really important, you have to plan very early. And when you select your site, you have to be careful that my site messes with, with soil. So that means you need to have some kind of soil information. Does this mean I have to be soil expert? Go and collect soil and do the survey? No need. You need some kind of indication that what site can be good. For example, if you look at NRCS map, this is really clear that how the soil structure would be, what is the capability of the soil, whether alfalfa would be good fit for the field. The second is soil test. If you can do a soil test, that wonderful. You don't have to do a soil test every year. Every three to five years is good. But for the first time, you have to do a soil test, and then, you can, you can really confirm that whether I can grow alfalfa or not. And then, do I need some previous experience? You don't have to be a very expert on, on soil. Your friend could be, your neighbor friend would be a good friend. Or you can ask me, call me, any extension agent. They can help you. You need little bit of ex knowledge of alfalfa. What is alfalfa? Like today's meeting you are here, if you are really new in alfalfa, that will be very helpful for you to start planting, planting alfalfa. So number two is species and variety selection. The call I got as a forest specialist in Wyoming, 98% call I got from my producer, my clientele, they asked me, Anwar, tell me what variety should I plant? So this is the number one question. So you can select yourself. How are you going to do that? Number one, you have to select your variety based on adaptation. That means how long alfalfa can be persist once you establish successful. In general, alfalfa can be, if you well managed, alfalfa can last 10 years, no problem. In my experience, I am in, in Wyoming from 2008, okay? I have flow, I have been managing that one without any declination without any decline of quality and quality. So if you manage oil, that's good. So what the thing you need to consider, number one, soil. Okay, perfect soil. So when you are talking, uh, listening to irrigation talk in the morning and night, so what do say that soil needs to be very good. Alfalfa requires a lot of water. So alfalfa requires good soil, good fertile soil, Depth of soil, you need higher water table, but not too close, about three feet depth. And then, very well drained soil, okay? If you have stand, standing water, this is not a good field you can select for alfalfa, okay? And then the climate, okay? What climate alfalfa can grow? So that means <coughs> there is a range of tolerance, right? You can select your alfalfa variety 
based on dominance 11. There are dominance 1 to 10, right? And what dominance you are going to select based on your climbing. If you go too dominant, that's not good. If you go too low, that's not good as well. Okay? And then the pace. Sometimes you know that I have a friend, he's doing alfalfa, and he has a problem with alfalfa in autumn. I would try to buy a variety that has nematode resistance of it. Because I am expecting my area could have nematode as well. So that's another important thing to consider. Of course, high yielding, no doubt on that, you will be selecting a variety based on high yielding. And then, what is your intention in this? Are you going to produce only biomass, like hay stones, or you are planning to increase your protein? Are you going to produce only hay? Or are you going to feed uh, uh, like horses or dairy industry? So it's different of what is the intention of you. Based on that, there are a lot of variety you can select one of these. And then finally, another important aspect is soil testing. Local soil, not only soil, variety testing as well. So if you have variety testing with us local, I could help my area, but you have a lot of local extension again. You can ask them. Is there any information available? And based on that, this is really helpful selecting a variety. Any questions so far? I, I am going maybe too fast or too slow. So, okay, any question? It's very known factor, but some tips I am giving, if you can follow that, that will make you a successful alfalfa grower in the future if you are planning or if you are already growing alfalfa. So, plant please high quality alfalfa. How can I get it? So really you use certified seeds. He will be asking me if I want to buy a certified seeds, it costs a lot of money. Yeah, I know, I agree on that. It costs a lot of money, but it will pay you later if you really successful. Because you are planning alfalfa for next 10 years, not for two years or 10, three years. So if you pay up front some money, that will pay off. So <coughs> if I use certified seeds, you are, you are sure you are getting huge benefits on that then you are not spreading any noxious weed because certified seeds is free of noxious weed. And it might have very few other weed or other seeds. So that's, you are not contaminating your neighbor. It's really good. And sometimes seed might come with treatment, okay, like seed coating. For example, it might come with fungicides, it might come with seed coating. But be careful on that. If I say, if you ask me, call me, what is the seeding rate I am going to use? Then I say, it, okay, 10 pounds or 15 pounds per acre. You go and plant, that's not correct. You have to adjust your best on the seed coding. Long time research suggests there is no persistent or consistent benefit using coding seed. But the idea is mostly fungicide treatment. It really helps because of the tiny seedlings at the beginning a lot of fungus attacks can be treated with this. But make sure you adjust. Sometimes if the coating is too high, probably it could cost you seed rate to increase about one third of the total rate. For example, if I give you, if you are planning to plant 10 pounds per acre, if it is one third of the seeding coat, you have to increase your seeding rate by five pounds. That means you have to plant 15 pounds. If you go 10 pounds, that means you are reducing your seeding rate 5 pounds. That would be one of the cause why you are going to fail. So I'll give you a specific example on that in a minute. Another important aspect to be successful in, in establishment of alpha, proper inoculation. Don't think you have inoculation, you have inoculated bacterial inoculant that you use for red clover or sand pine or bars for tree for other. This is species-specific rhizobium bacteria. You have to use for species-specific. Don't use other bacteria to alfalfa. Okay, there is a picture here you can see that what is the difference between inoculated versus no inoculated. And you can see a lot of modulation because of the rhizobium bacteria. And you can test that by yourself. At the early stage, you can go. I don't really want to stay here. I want to come close to you. So, what I you do? So what I could do really is 
specifically, if we go at the early stage, you can, when the seedling is like that, you can do by yourself. It does not take too time, actually. You can go dig some of the plants and look at your nodulation, all the nodulation. And you wash off the roots and look at whether these are pink color. You can cut up some of the nodules. If it is pink color, you are sure they are fixing nitrogen. If not, there is a problem. Okay, you have to add probably nitrogen that way. But it's a legume, you don't want to add nitrogen. I am coming to this point very soon. So this is another important aspect about buying seeds. So when you try to buy seeds, make sure you have a level certified seeds. And normally certified seeds come with blue tag, okay? So blue tag means it's a certified seeds. So you can see purity of the seeds, wheat, how much wheat, no noxious wheat, that's the important criteria of certified seeds, okay? Now, what is the bad thing in this level? Can anybody tell me? Quickly look at them. Because you are going to buy the seeds, 50 pound bags. This is the level, level on that. What is the wrong in this? What is wrong in this level? It's hard seed Right. This is hard seed. Normally, alfalfa is about 10 to 15 percent, and in some cases, 30 percent hard seed. This is normal. Because this hard seed can come in the later on. That's no problem. 15 percent is all right. But there is a problem here. Look at that. The date. Okay? So that is a, that's the reason I intentionally put 2008 seeds. When you buy the seeds, when you call the company and ask them, and they send the seeds, make sure you look at the level, and this is not acceptable. This seed was tested 2008. There is no way, if they, they gave me a free of this seed, I will not take it. Because every year seed germination and everything changes. Okay, you need to make sure that the date is correct. Otherwise, and I'll give a specific example of that. So there are two seed lot. Normally, seed, seed, seeding date calculated based on pure live seed basis. Okay. So pure live seed means how many? If you plant 100 seeds, does 100 seed will germinate? It might be 99. It might be 96. It might be 94. That's called pure live seed. <coughs> it's very easy to calculate germination times purity and then divide by 100, you'll get very easy calculation, okay? And then, if, for example, you have a seed lot, one, it has purity 99%, purity 95%, germination is low here, 73, but purity is very high. And whereas germination is 92. And if I use this formula, I can easily calculate 73 versus 88 pure live seeds. Now, if I ask a question, which lot you are going to buy? Lot number two or lot number one? Two. Why I am giving, you are right, two. Why I am going to give an example here? Because you have to first calculate how much seed I need. You call me and I told you, okay, go ahead and plant 10 pounds per acre. That's not correct. Because you have to calculate based on this how much you really need, based on pure life seeds. So use this simple formula and then divide by percent pure life seeds, and that will give you really the actual seed you are going to plant. For example here, if you buy 10 pounds per acre, pure life seeds, and it costs about $3 per pound, even if you are going to plant Roundup radial pulpa, that costs 10 to $12 per pound, right? It's a significant amount of money. So now, if you calculate this, look at this actual seed, I need for second lot is only 11 versus on 14 pounds. So it's quite a bit low. And then you can even save $7 per pound. And when you go down of the alfalfa, or if you have 500 acres, look at this how much money you can save only, only using the PLS, pure life. It's a very simple tip. Okay, now come to another point is fertilization. Of many times I got a question, do I need to fertilize my alfalfa? If yes, what should be? Should I fertilize with nitrogen? So really, you have to look at the soil test result first. You do the soil test, or if you have some soil test done, if you have not, have not done that, please do so. And then check whether do I need, is that, because alfalfa requires a lot of phosphorus, okay? So you can incorporate some phosphorus as well. Also, do I need nitrogen at the, at the time of planting? 
So normally, if the soil test says that you have very low nitrogen, at the beginning you might add 20 pounds max, normally recommended at the beginning. But also the soil test is very low of nitrogen, then you can add nitrogen until they fix the nitrogen. That's the reason I told you, please dig some of your plants and look at the nodulation of the plants and then you can start, you don't have to add any nitrogen on that. And then, if you sometimes we plant with companion crop or other crops like oat, barley, tt kelly, whatever, then in that, this is generally, we need some nitrogen on that, especially in the low nitrogen level. Then sometimes when you till the soil, mineralization might happen. That might sometimes release nitrogen or, or decrease nitrogen. So in that situation, you have to add some nitrogen as well. And also, sometimes if you have a lot of stubbles in the soil, it's better always to add some nitrogen at the beginning. And then, be careful on that. If you add too much nitrogen at the beginning, as I told you, alfalfa seeds is very tiny, seedlings are very low, <coughs> low vigor. So please don't add too much nitrogen. Then it will be the heaven for wheat, not for alfalfa. So be careful on that. Now, what is the general guidelines for applying fertilizer? This is a very common guideline. Legume normally does not need any nitrogen. If you really properly inoculate, right, bacteria. Number one, if you add too much nitrogen, legume would be lazy, alfalfa would be lazy, they will not fix any nitrogen, okay? Number two, look at the pH, okay? Soil pH is very important. Also look at the phosphorus level in the soil. If you have really low phosphorus, please try to incorporate phosphorus. And then another important is we call alfalfa <coughs> is a potash loving plant. It requires a lot of potash. Okay, be, be, make sure that you add a lot of potassium on that. And then if you have a mixture of alfalfa and other grass, do I need to add nitrogen? It really depends on the condition of the mixture. If you have normally 40% or above legume in the mixture, really you don't need to add any nitrogen. This is a common recommendation, but you might need. Be careful on that. So this is an example of that. Alfalfa in general, what is your yield target? Say your yield target is 5 ton per acre. Then how much phosphorus I am going to add? In general, per ton, normally you we add about 15 pounds P2O5, okay? And then, you, get, you are adding about 75. And then how much potassium is very much high, about three times higher than phosphorus level. So it should be about 45 pounds per ton of yield. That means you can add up, up to 225 pounds. But remember again, this is P2O5, K2O. This is not the pot muriate of potash or potash. This is not the TSP. So you have to adjust this rate as well based on this percentage as well, okay? So now, how, really do we need phosphorus and potassium? Yes, we need, because they are alfalfa is phosphorus and potash loving plant. So you can see some of the picture that this is deficient in, these two are deficient in phosphorus and potassium, and when you add all, how much growth you can get from that. So what are the phosphorus source? Their main source is superphosphate or triple superphosphate. Uh, this has about 46% potash P2O5. Make sure you adjust based on this percentage. Don't add like 15 pounds means 15 pounds triple superphosphate, okay? Make sure you adjust the rate. Now, some of you might be saying, do we have a new phosphorus deficiency in, in Colorado <coughs> or in Wyoming or in Nebraska? In general, our soil has a lot of potassium. How many did you see any phosphorus or potassium deficiency in your soil? Anybody have any experience? This is Wyoming picture, one of the lands in Laramie. So look at this. This looks like a disease. It could be a worm problem. It could be an insect problem. It could be a disease problem. Then when you look at very closely from the same field, it looks like that. This is a healthy plant and there are a lot of spot, spot over there. That's a typical symptom of uh, potassium in alfalfa plant, okay? And then, in the older plant, you look at mostly in the older plant. If you look at more closely, these are the younger leaves, these are the older leaves. 
So potassium is very movable, okay? It's move, move very quickly. As a reason, young, see, young, actually young leaves does not show up, although they have deficiencies, they will not show up. But the older plants show up very quickly. So if you see some of the plants like that, it is obvious time to look at potassium level in your soil. If you even see only one plant in your whole 500 acres, you have to check your soil and look at whether any potassium deficiency in the soil. Because many plants, they are still extracting potassium from the soil, they are hidden under level. They did not show up, but in the near future they are, they are going to show up. So what are the other factors? Seed bed preparation. We know all this, this is very common, we can prepare seed, we can start from the flowering, but we need to make sure the seed is very tiny, you need very relatively level soil, we normally start with plowing, or if you are planting, like you have a other crops and you are going to plant, for example, after oat or barley, then you can start with this thing. And then, really, what is the important factor here? The cloth. So if you have a cloth like that, and if you have a cloth like that, don't think you are going to be successful in your alfalfa planting. Because the tiny seeds, if you have a cloth like that, it will be failed, no doubt. And then, you are uh, reducing the competition from other species, then you are, uh, you are reducing the uh, competition from live species, with species, and then you might have some of this trouble on that. But not too much. If you have too much, that might be a problem, I'll show you in a minute. And then, other important aspect, you need moisture in the soil, especially during the time of germination and emergence. And this is really a very ideal seed bed preparation. You do start plowing or disking, then uh, reducing this, then follow it by uh, corrugation. And then compactness of the soil is really important. Why? Because you need good seed and soil contact, otherwise you are going to fail. So you don't need, if you don't have equipment, no matter, we can use, like this is in Laramie, one of the producer wife, she was borrowing this from a golf course. It was fallen over there. And her center people, she was running round and round and round with this five pig. And he was successful in planting alfalfa and very successful. Still she is doing that. So we don't need very expensive machineries as well to compact the soil. So now, this is an ideal seed bed. You, you, feed, you can see some of the alfalfa coming here. This is in Wyoming, I am giving an example. And you can see this is very nice, right? You have, you can see the wheel track over there. Now, what are the problem? The problem could be if it is heavy soil, there should be a problem with the casting. And if it is sandy soil, the problem would be the soil erosion and seed might be blown away. And the other would be it is because of the water shortage, the seedling might desiccate quickly or disappear or die. So now. Should I, which is better, clean seed bed, or we can go like this? Which would be better, top or bottom? There is always an argument against and in favor, but in here I already told some of the problem. But here, there should be some problem as well. For example, disease development at the early stage, okay? But here, you can have a lot of moisture as well. I'll give a specific example in Torrington area, where what we did, we, this is a clean till versus some of the stubble over here. So it, it was planted in May, okay? And then, after three weeks, we can see the very nice stand here, a lot of stand. But you know how much wind we have in Wyoming. And next year, actually, this was a successful stand compared to this year. We don't have too much stubble. It actually casts a lot of moisture, and this is the barley stable, uh, yeah, barley stable, and it's only very small amount, and that really help protect the wind, and we had a very successful stand in the bottom compared to here. So it really depends on if you have moisture, no moisture problem, you don't, it is under central pivot, no problem, you can go either way, but this would be better for central pivot, but if you have other crops you are planning, this could be a better way of doing that. Now, seeding rate. So, seeding rate. 
okay? How much seed we are going to plant, okay? So it's really related to the size of the seeds, okay? And then, <coughs> pure live seed. As I told you before, please calculate your seeding rate based on pure live seed, I gave the formula. And then, germination bigger, okay? If the seedlings are very low, we have maybe we need to add a little bit more on this. And the soil condition. Whether it is sandy soil, whether it is heavy soil, or it's a clay soil, based on this you have to prepare your seed, seeding rate. And then always consider that you have to think about expected mortality, how much mortality of the plant. When you plant alfalfa 10 pounds, for example, per acre, you have more than 50 plants per square feet. You don't need 50 plants per square feet. How many plants do you need to be successful? per square feet. Correct. This is the scientifically correct. If you go even less than 25, still it will be okay. But scientifically 25 is the standard number. So if you have 50 to 100, naturally it will be thin out to 25, around 25. That's enough for you to be a successful stand. Then this is the number one point I mentioned, that planting two days is the major cause of seeding failure. In my state, actually, in Wyoming, it's the number one cause in many areas as well. So, what would be the ideal? You go about one fourth to half inch, but more than that. That would be the perfect. But, if your soil is sandy, it can go a little bit more about quarter, three quarter, that's fine. If you go more than that, there is a chance you are going to lose your stand. So, there are machines, if you have machinery, that's fine. Nowadays, you can control the seeding depth with the band. And, but if you don't, there's no problem. Uh, if you compact the soil, then you don't have chance to go to deep. And this is another important factor, seed to soil contact, because germination is important, right? So if you have really, really loose soil, then there is no contact of seed and soil and there is a 99% chance they are going to lose your stand. So why? Because at the beginning, the, the very tiny seeds, they need a lot of water. In general, they need about 100 times of their weight of water. So this water is coming from the soil to the seeds. So if you don't have this contact, then you are going to lose your stand. And then this is really seed to good soil, Seed to soil contact is really important to have very good germination and stand establishment. So now, if you use no-till drill, there is a backer wheel at the back. That's really do the job. Really, this is this does the job. So if this is actually pack the soil, and is there is you place the seeds here. This is the band. You place the seeds here, and this really pack the soil. That's create very good seed to soil contact. But Again, you said, I don't have this uh, high-tech machines with me. I don't have money to buy that one as well. How can I do? You can use the compact the soil, and then you start planting. No problem at all. Okay, so normally how can I justify whether my soil is compact or not? It's a very simple way. Before you plant, walk around the plot, and if you see that you cannot see your footprint is not deeper than 114. This is a clear indication that soil is compact. Another thing is, after planting, if you go to the plot, if you see, I cannot see any single seed on the, on the top of the surface. It is clear you planted too deep. You need to see at least 10% seeds on the surface. That's a clear indication that you did not plant too deep. Okay, it's a very simple tips. Planting time. Now another question I got, what time should I plant? Alfalfa can be plant any month, 12 months a year, no matter. Okay, I can guarantee you will be successful. If you follow my tips, you can plant 12 months, no problem at all. How? Is it possible to plant alfalfa in 12 months? Yes, you can. But what is the best time? I always say, you should plant when ours are the best, okay? That's the time you should plant, that's the normal year. So for example, in Wyoming condition, it could be very similar to Colorado, also in Nebraska, western part, especially in May, like springtime is the best time of the planting. 
But remember, this is the best time. But in, in Wyoming, for example, we have frost every month except in August. Okay? So there is a frost damage always happening. So if you can stop this quickly, then you don't have to worry about the frost damage. So look at this weather condition. It's very similar to Colorado as well. So normally we have highest rainfall in the month of May and June. That's the reason why we plan in May and June. And if you look at the temperature in August and July is the highest temperature and then tapering down. So that's the reason May is the best time to plan. But remember, May is the best time for our competitor, for the enemy, wheat. Okay? A lot of wheat competition will be coming on that time as well. We have to manage the wheat as well. And then what are the alternative planting time? You can plant either in May or you can plant in summer, August, provided that you have plenty of water available. I prefer planting in August if I have water. The reason is you don't have to worry too much controlling wheat. Because this is the month when wheat pressure is being. <coughs> so then you don't have to spray anything, it will be naturally controlled. Okay? And the other is, as I told, that alfalfa can be planted 12 months. You can plant as a <coughs> okay? In many areas, you have less access to equipment. In that case, you can go and plant in November to March, when temperature is really below 40 degrees, and there is no chance of germination. Please don't plant before November. If you plant, you are going to lose. Because some of the seedlings will be started just germinating, at that time snow will come, it will kill everything. So make sure you plant at the time, this is called dormant planting, when temperature is low, it will be in the soil, and when in March, when the snow melted, this will quickly go to the soil, and you will have a beautiful stand on that. And then, you can spring also early spring, but make sure early spring there is a chance of snow injury, frost injury, you have to be very careful, you have to watch the weather chart and then you can go and plant on that. Now, the final thing is weed control. Okay? So, weed control is not easy. But in alfalfa, a good news for you, alfalfa is so competitive, so it can be easily controlled by itself. Okay? So, Cultural practice is the best. If you have a good stand, you don't have to worry too much about wheat control. <coughs> First year, do some mowing. Few mowing would be enough for you to control all this alfalfa. And next year, alfalfa will outcompete everything, okay? So don't worry about that. But in our scenario, you can use some pre-emergence herbicide or post-emergence herbicide. But make sure, if you have a mixture of alfalfa and grass, you are restricted. You cannot use any of the method, any of the herbicides really, recommended to go for alfalfa and grass mix. And then another good option is making Roundup Ready alfalfa, and you can go and spray, then you will control really, that's could be another trick. But another problem would be, if you have alfalfa, Roundup Ready alfalfa, how you are going to control them? So there is another topic we can talk later. And then, clipping is really important tips to control, and alfalfa will take care of this. So I'll stop it here, and uh, very happy today to be here with you. And again, uh, if you have any question, I have contact information, I can give you my card. Feel free to contact me. There are many things we can talk, but today I'll stop. I'm going to stop it here. Thanks once again for your patience and listening to me. Very good question from Tom, and I was expecting that, this question.
So Tom asks me that how much in Okulam, right? How much in Okulam do I need to use to inoculate the seeds? That's number one question. And number two question was, is there any heat effect, heat effect or cold effect on inoculation that can kill bacteria? Very good question. Number one, you know, only, you don't need too much inoculum. If you take one spoon of inoculum, it might have millions of bacteria on that. So you don't need really too much inoculum. Only important thing is, you need to inoculate properly so that all the seeds got inoculation, or nearby seeds, you have the bacteria over there, okay? So how I am going to do that? Very simple tips. If you have inoculum, and you, you are, nowadays you can buy inoculated seeds, it's coating, but you can buy the inoculum and you can use by yourself. How you can do that? Make sure, don't use on water. If you use only water, and spray on the seeds, by the time you are pumping, you are on the machine, what happens if it is a hot day, water will be evaporated, and all the inoculum at the bottom of the drain box, it will not go to the right place. So what I would suggest sometimes, use some sticky substance. For example, I use myself for experiment, I don't recommend that. I use even Coke, soft drink. I use Coke or Sprite, little bit, and I spray on that. And it has sugar on this, right? It will not harm at all. So then, it, it mix very nicely, put in the box, and walk around. It will stay on the seeds for a long time. There is no chance. But you use a lot of inoculum, you did not really mix well, and your inoculum will be spread on the, some part of the plot, rest of the plot, no inoculum at all. So we get a very nice question. And the question, how much I am going to use, no matter. If only one spoon would be enough for your 50 pound bag. You don't need too much, right? One spoon is enough for your 50 pound bag, okay? You don't have to use one pound of that, okay? But you have to, but if you eat more, you add more, there is no harm at all, okay? Add more, no harm at all. It will not be harmful. And another good thing is once you put, just spray, put the inocula in the soil, really you don't need to inoculate anymore because the bacteria will be over there for years after years. And the other question was, does heat actually affect or kill the bacteria? Normally, what do I would suggest? First, when you buy the inoculum, order the inoculum and told them to ship it. Yes, there is a great effect of heat on the inoculum, killing the inoculum. If it is too hot, it will kill the bacteria. So what I would suggest, when you order by phone, I need some inoculum on one bag, whatever ounce you are going to buy, Tell them to ship it overnight. Don't ship it three, four nights. It will be in the car. By this time, inoculum will be at your home. 50%, 60% already died. So yes, heat is the effect. Heat has the effect on killing bacteria. And the other thing, immediately take out the bacterial inoculum back, put it in your cool place or in the, your refrigerator. Okay, then you are safe. It will not be killed. And the other thing, if it is a very hot, warm day, you are planting in June, okay, first of June or a very hot day, I would recommend either plant in the morning, early in the morning, or in the afternoon, not in the middle of the day, because if you plant very hot day, bacteria might be killed as well. Very good question. Did I answer your question? Okay. Any other question?